Um, so my name is uh, Stuart from Instinct Technology. So you might have got this invite directly from us, or you might have got it from Ann, who's from Microsoft, who's sitting in the uh, the back there, uh, or Lauren, or one of your account managers. Um, so I'm a techo. I'm not a salesperson. Um, I enjoy um, talking about stuff, so hence why I get these duties. So you don't find too many technical people that can uh, that can talk. Um, I also have a vast selection of um, Star Wars Lego. So if you see, I've, uh, I've Lego themed this entire presentation. So um, if you don't like Lego, um, you don't struggle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, start heckling now. Or? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I like talking with my hands. So if I gesticulate wildly, then you know, uh, you know, I'm passionate about about something. So. Um, so a little bit about us, we're um, headquartered in Brisbane as a uh, gold communications and a gold cloud productivity partner. So they're actually tightening a lot of these competencies up. So anyone that's silver or gold or gold more for uh, relevantly uh, has to go through a lot of uh, rigor around metrics from Microsoft in terms of usage of the product and adoption and things like that. Uh, we're also a silver enterprise mobility partner around um, Intune and EMS and those kind of things. Uh, we've sold about 140,000 seats of Office 365 across about 130 customers. Um, so we've got a lot of experience in 365 and uh, Spark for Business. Um, and again, we're um, headquartered in Brisbane, so you should like us and buy lots of stuff from us. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also won the uh, uh, Emerging Partner of the Year Award last year, Australian Partner Awards for Microsoft, um, Emerging Partner of the Year. So that's a part of it's been started in the last couple of years that has demonstrated growth um, and, and meeting a lot of um, rigor around Microsoft's um, metrics around partnership. So what we do, just quickly, um, we do Hyper-V, System Center Suite and Agile. Um, main reason you're here today is the productivity piece. We do like Link, Skype for Business Exchange, 365, tied in with Polycom, Akano and Sonus from a session border controller perspective. Um, and we're starting to do a lot more in the identity space. So we've, put, we've built a, um, an automation platform that we call Map, which can either sit on-prem or in Azure which is talking about synchronizing identity between line of business apps and things like that. So it's built on top of BIM or MIM, um, as it's now known. Um, but we're seeing a lot of um, requirements for that in the market from everyone leaving the cloud services and things like that and using a lot of different identities. So um, that's definitely a growth business for us. So what we're here today, um, I had a really good line to use and I said, I was going to say it's a, it's a very exciting time to be a Skype for Business partner. I'm using the political rhetoric of the time. Um, but as you can see, we've gone through a lot of um, evolution of the uh, of the Skype for Business product. Um, so you can see we went from OTS R2 to 2010, into 2013, and we kind of reskinned that Skype for Business, uh, and then we put it in the cloud. Um, and the session today, we're going to talk about the roadmap uh, for the, sort of the next six months. Um, also, some of the releases from the last couple of months in terms of things that are really relevant for uh, any customers using Skype for Business. Or any customers that want to um, to look at it, adopting it. So where are we next? As you can see, it's um, there's no Lego theme on here, but I'm starting to get into the Lego um, thing here. So where we see the direction of the product from a Microsoft perspective is that we're getting to parity. So any of these cloud services and stuff, stuff for business and Exchange, SharePoint Online, any of these um, uh, products from Microsoft that were traditionally an on-premise product are now being ported into the um, uh, cloud service. And it's going to be a, a parity and this is supposed to represent beyond. So these products are starting to be, go beyond what you can actually do um, through the on-premise um, product. Uh, so we had Exchange, went to Exchange Online, SharePoint Online, SharePoint that went to SharePoint Online. We've now got Configure Config Manager, which is now being superseded by Intune. Intune's coming out with a lot more features that Config Manager does not have. Um, Active Directory, and we're now seeing that go to Azure Active Directory. Um, <coughs> BizTalk, if anyone's got BizTalk, now that's going to be imported to stuff like Azure Service Bus. Um, so as you can see, the, um, from a Microsoft perspective, these all these products that were traditionally employed on-prem uh, are, going, are going cloud. And Skype <coughs> Business this has probably been the slowest one to do, to do that. Purely from a real-time comms perspective, it's been a more difficult problem to solve. Um, we can also look at Office 365 Groups. Is anyone familiar with Office 365 Groups? Yeah, Anne is, obviously, <laughs> Dan is. Uh, so Groups is something that's going to uh, sit across a lot of different products. So Exchange, SharePoint, Skype for Business, Yammer, all that sort of stuff. You can see Groups 
is something you can't do with the on-premise product. You have to do it in, in Office 365. And Groups gives you an ad hoc way to collaborate with your teams, uh, automatically provisions mailboxes, all that kind of stuff for small, um, small work for teams. Um, if any of you, um, I was just going to mention advanced threat protection. Has anyone looked at E5, the new E5 suite with advanced threat protection from Microsoft? Um, we think E5, the, one of the big things that we're going to the suite a little bit later, but uh, we think E5 with advanced threat protection is, um, is a really good offering for customers. It does stuff like safe link protection. So when you get an email that comes in from a, uh, through Exchange Online Protection or anything else, it will actually rewrite the link that the user sees in their email. So every link that gets sent an email is rewritten by ATP service. The ATP service scans that link, make sure it's not malicious. Uh, so when the user clicks on the link, they actually go to the, the ATP service, make sure it's, um, and if it is deemed as, uh, you know, uh, an invalid site, uh, it will tell the user and say, no, you can't, we don't recommend you go to this site. Um, We've also got safe attachments, so same concept, but the attachments are scanned by um, the Advanced Threat Protection Service. A virtual machine spun up, runs the runs the program or the attachment that you uh, have been sent, and if there's a, a virus in there, it'll alert the user. So this is prior to the user actually clicking on anything. This stuff is all is all being done. But I thought I'd just quickly mention that because I think it's one of the um, really cool really cool things in E5. So, um, in a regional context, I thought I'd just talk quickly about this, is that um, Microsoft is a North American headquartered company, so they tend to have a lot of uh, a North American uh, view of the world. Um, Australia has a difficult um, regulatory environment in terms of, um, if you think about what Microsoft's bringing to market now, in terms of the cloud services, they need to go through a bunch of regulatory hoops uh, to not only become a carrier, become a um, person that can offer porting services for numbers, uh, to offer PSDN ranges, tele telephony circuits, all that kind of stuff. They've got to jump through all those regulatory hoops. So Australia is, um, you know, Microsoft have been going through that for a period of time, and um, we hope that we were going to be able to announce something uh, soon around the PSDN offerings from Microsoft, but um, it's been put off in contractual negotiations. So um, my Anne and Microsoft and, and the partner community will be able to share something we think this year in terms of what I'm going to get into in a little bit. Um, but just so you understand the regulatory context, we're not we're not the US, we don't have a, a very deregulated telephony market like the US. The US, you can basically do whatever the hell you feel like. You can, anyone can become a telco and do whatever else. So a lot of these products we're going to talk about have been US first because the regulatory environment is a bit more lax. Um, so customers can go ahead and you know, consume all these services from, uh, from Microsoft without too, too much regulatory concern. Um, so I'm going to show you about the Cloud PBX, uh, Skype meeting broadcast stuff, and the Cloud Connect edition. That's available now. So if you have to do something, um, there's alternatives for the um, what I'm about to show you. Um, PSDN conferencing and PSDN calling, I'll go into these. Um, we're looking at tentatively by the end of the year. Um, but yeah, one does not simply walk into, uh, walk into Telco and uh, decide I'm just going to become a Telco in Australia. It's a bit more convoluted. Um, so what's new in the product? So some of these have been released over the last three to four months. Uh, we've got Skype meeting broadcast is what we're doing today. So I'll do a little bit of demo on that. Um, we've got Cloud PDX. So Cloud PDX is the ability to use your uh, Skype for Business instance in Office 365 as a phone system. So it gives you core control. It gives you the stuff that you use for getting out of Skype for Business on premise. You can now be able to do that out of Office 365. So we're talking about the future of not having any PDXs, not having any you know, PSD and connect connectivity at your sites purely all delivered through Office 365, and this is where stuff like Expression Route and um, those uh, non-contented links and stuff from Microsoft make, uh, make a lot of sense for those large customers uh, to be able to give yourself the quality of service to the Office 365 uh, data centers. Um, we'll go into the cloud here a little bit later. Uh, PSD and conferencing, so that's Microsoft becoming your uh, t uh, your call pit, your bridge, your audio bridge. So effectively, if you're paying money to Telstra or you're paying <coughs> to any of these ACP, um, what they call them, um, audio, audio bridges, um, Telstra conference link, those sort of things, Microsoft will be able to do this out of Office 365 and give you dial-in numbers anywhere in the world. I think at, at the moment it's 90 countries. 
um, and that will just keep expanding. So you can run a tenant, run Office 365 out of an Australian tenant, um, or a Singapore tenant, or a Hong Kong tenant, or anything else, and get dial-in numbers to your Skype users anywhere in the world. So if you want to run a global business and have uh, run a, run a meeting, and if you have a dial-in number in Toronto, or a dial-in number in London, or a dial-in number in wherever, Argentina, there's ones in Colombia, so if anyone's into it, but uh, yeah, it's, there's a crazy amount of countries and a crazy amount of um, uh, area codes that, um, that Microsoft have that reach for the global scale of Office 365. The next one is PSDN calling. So this is getting your telephony services from Microsoft. So Microsoft would become your telephony carrier. So they're effectively competitive to, Microsoft, uh, to Telstra and Optus and APT and all these other guys. So Microsoft will be able to offer you uh, telephony services out of Office 365. So you get your 100 number ranges, you get your um, I, uh, SIP services, all that sort of stuff. Microsoft hide all that from you. They just, you, they'll deliver you a, a telephony service through that. That's with your own number range or one? Yes, yep, yep. so you'll be able to port. Uh, the porting process isn't clear right now. In the US, you can do stuff like port one number out of a range um, to the service, but I don't believe you'll be able to do that in Australia. So I think Australia will be blocks, um, not, uh, probably continuous blocks. Um, but the porting process hasn't been ironed out yet. In the US, they have a, a different system. Um, but yeah, you will absolutely you'll be able to port from Microsoft to Telstra, and that's all driven through a GUI. You don't have to fill out a billion different forms from Telstra to say I want to leave the service. You do it all through the admin console. I want to move these numbers, lodge the porting process, and back into Microsoft handles all the, the transition of those numbers from uh, from your incumbent telco to, to Microsoft. So did you say SIP support as well? Uh, yeah, so yeah, the one I you say, I was probably a bit disingenuous, but it will be a SIP trunk behind the scenes, you just won't see it. It'll be delivered into the tenant, so you won't see that. Um, they're not going to lay ISDN connections for every customer, it'll be all um, SIP trunks in the background. Uh, so you won't be able to buy a SIP service per se uh, from so Microsoft. You're buy a subscription per user basis. Subscription, yeah, yeah. So um, stuff like the billing and stuff it hasn't been worked out yet. Um, but if you look at the way Microsoft work with Office 365, is all the all the all your storage limits for SharePoint are pooled. So it'll be a similar model for pooling um, stuff like domestic minutes, international minutes, and that will be pooled across all your users. So you might have a user that uses three thousand international call out amounts a month, you might have used 10. So the, you don't get, it's amalgamated or pulled across that whole tenant. So that's, from a consumption model, that's where it's, um, that's where it's going. Um, domestic domestic PSN calling, I don't know, it might even subject to Microsoft. It, it, it's probably, it will be likely free domestically. Um, international might be a different, different story. Um, but again, it'll be pulled across the tenant. So, um, the reason why I think they will be very generous with the calling. Um, if you think about it, they've built this massive backbone <coughs> for telephony worldwide. They want to, get, want to get some return out of it, but I'm not gouging anyone. Suffice to say, I imagine it'll be cheaper than Telstra. Um, I'm really hoping there's not a good Telstra. Yeah, hopefully, probably some Telstra. Hi. <laughs> The next one is Mac client. So, has anyone got Macs or stuff business and has Macs and hates Link 2011? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I don't know. You may not, may or may not have got an email in the last couple of days around a preview, Skype preview. So, if you go to skypreview.com, um, you can sign up as an IT pro or an administrator and request access to the uh, Skype for Business Mac client beta. So, it's been done in three drops. So, the Mac, the client is out right now. Um, I've had a couple of customers running it. Um, every week they're releasing new builds, it's getting, getting really nice. It's really nice looking feel, much better than 2011. Um, but it's a lot of customers yelling at Microsoft to get this product out there because it's stopping a lot of, um, there's a lot of blockers and a lot of adoption uh, for the Mac client. So, um, so again, it's been done in three drops. It'll drop to do meetings first. So if you're doing Skype for business meetings, it'll work for meetings. Next is IM. So they'll drop the IM functionality into the client. So at the moment, it's just it does meetings. They'll drop IM functionality into Client and then third drop will be voice. So the voice, um, and what I've seen so far is it's, it's pretty much on parity with the PC, the PC version. Um, but yeah, just go to skypreview.com, sign up with your um, uh, Outlook account. I don't think you need an all, all right there account. 
Um, and you can request access to the different pro programs and then Microsoft Corp will approve you. So if you are a Microsoft managed partner and or someone may be able to smooth that process for you and get you um, access earlier, but um, I found they're pretty good um, getting on the programs. These are, these, are, these are beta programs, so you will, I wouldn't so put your CEO on this. Um, <laughs> it might be a career limiting move. Um, but uh, yeah, um, you, can, you can get it out to your teams and get, and get them using it. Uh, another one that's coming out, come out recently is offline messaging. So this is just Windows only at this point, Windows and Windows. Uh, so if anyone's familiar with WhatsApp, a lot of the feedback from Microsoft, uh, to Microsoft around why can't I have WhatsApp, why can't I have the WhatsApp experience of, or the fiber experience of texting someone and they just get the meeting when they go online. Um, so they're taking that feedback and building offline messaging into the Windows um, clients or Windows to Windows. So if you IM someone and they're not online, they'll get the message delivered uh, next time. Is anyone using 2016 Skype for Business Client at all at the moment? And do you, are you getting the knock knock stuff when you get the meeting? So when you're due to join a meeting. Oh, yeah, they call it pop up? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's just gone out to the uh, current branch for Office 365. So if you notice that, so now there's um, so when you're due for a meeting, uh, Skype will actually pop up a little, little toast saying you're due to join this meeting. So it's got um, some customers don't like it. I actually think it's really good because how many times have you met? You've been on a meeting and you're waiting for someone to join. It's just kind of saying, hey, you need to get in here and, and start doing this. So. Um, so I think these sort of things that are coming through the client um, uh, are really quite cool. Uh, the next thing is Cloud Connector Edition. This only was released uh, about two weeks ago. Um, so we'll go into, I've got a whole section on Cloud Connector, but um, Cloud Connector is effectively your BYO telco experience. So while you're waiting for Microsoft to, to go through those, jump through those hoops of regulatory environment, if you want to do uh, Cloud PDH right now, you use the Cloud Connector Edition to tie your your on-premise PSDN, so your IBM services or your existing PDXs, you use the Cloud Connector Edition to tie them into Office 365. And I'll show you show you what that looks like a little bit later. Um, Surface Hub uh, shipping um, shipping in the US and UK. Uh, and as you've got good news around Surface Hub, it can't be explicit, but hopefully we'll see it sometime this year. Um, but again, lots of customers really, really, really want um, Surface Hub uh, experience. I know in the UK they've pre-sold three and a half thousand hubs um, before, you know, um, that's what, what, what is it? Service so, uh, It's the uh, big 55 inch or the 84 inch uh, Windows 10 embedded uh, collaboration experience. So we don't have one here, uh, unfortunately. There's one in Sydney, two in Sydney. Video yes, 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 so it's got, um, yeah, it's got a bit of everything. Yeah, it's got a bit of everything. It's a full touch. Panel. It's a, it's a, do you remember a couple of years ago Microsoft bought a, a, platform, a, a company called Perceptive Pixel and they made those massive screens and you can see them on CNN and stuff and they're doing voting, um, yeah, they touch 100 points of touch, that sort of thing. So they've got that technology and they've condensed it down into a 55 and an 84 inch product um, and you put them on a wall and people walk up and it's, it's designed to really simplify the meeting room experience. So you do a whiteboard on it. Um, you can do a Skype for business meeting call. Um, it'll have it's like two 1080p cameras, one on each side, and it basically swaps depending on who's who's in the room. Um, so they're really popular, and they're actually at a good. Well, I think they're at a good price point. It's essentially just a Windows 10 device, and so as mm -hmm. such, can run Windows 10 app, so yep. Windows 10 mobile device. So if you have an app that's a video app and it's and it's on the Windows 10, it runs off the service hub. So it's a pretty it's really starting to change the options for meeting services. Yeah. Uh, so if you're a managed customer, um, Microsoft can probably do a range demo for you. Um, so what they actually do is there are only two of them, maybe three. Um, but what's similar, similar to what we've got today is that Microsoft can dial you in and they have a camera that looks that's looking at the hub. So you get to see the experience of using the hand uh, collaborating. Uh, so it also functions as a TV or a display, so you can plug HDMI into it, whatever else. You can mirror it past to it. Um, can't Chromecast to it for obvious reason. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, I think it'll be a real game changer for that meeting room experience. Um, if you, have you ever seen the smart room systems or the link room systems, um, the LRS systems? It's like that, but on steroids um, and at, a, at about half the price. So um, the Skype room systems for a 55, 65 inch was about 20, 25,000. 
with the market pricing we saw when it was last for the surface hub, the 55 inch was about 10 grand, much over 10 grand. So um, the 84 inch is about 28 grand, but it's it's a big it's a big investment. So we've got customers. Um, I've got one council customer that wants to buy a dozen of them, um, just to use as meeting rooms. So they're over. I think it's about 7,000 square meters, so they've got six, six or seven offices. And so then when they get in the car, they drive two hours from so two hours from one side of the from the uh, council to the center of town, and then two hours out the other way. So some people may be driving two, three, four hours to do meetings. So this is going to save them an absolute bucket of time, and also the risk of people jumping in cars and driving for two hours in council cars and stuff like that. The service hub, I think, is going to be a real um, Game changer for them. Not to mention that people just walk in and start drawing, um, drawing on the screen. Um, the other cool thing is it saves everything to OneNote. So you can, when you finish the meeting, you can email the OneNote straight to yourself. So you no longer do anyone have to write down notes, annotate on the board. Off you go. Uh, one thing I'm really excited about is Project Rigel. Um, so I'll go into that in a little bit. Project Rigel is basically taking the Surface Hub experience on Windows 10 and putting it on a commodity Surface Hub type that Surface. Pro devices. So, um, so guys like Logitech, Polycom, those guys in the in the, in the cheaper end of the uptown um, are looking at Project Rigel to, to, to cover the rest of those meeting room scenarios. So, if you think you can you put it on a NUC with a touch panel or a screen, um, you can get the Surface Hub like experience in, in, in software. Um, one of the other cool things that was really uh, spoken about a couple of months ago was um, a cloudy drop service. So is anyone familiar with Akano or Pexip or Blue Jeans or Blue Jeans? Yeah. So um, so those guys offer a, an interop service, which is basically if you are running a Skype meeting, a Skype business meeting, these guys can bring those uh, Polycom systems or those Tamburg systems or those Cisco systems into that Skype business meeting. So customers. That have put a massive investment into Cisco and things like that. Um, Interop is very important, so that you don't you don't just have to toss all those um, those endpoints out. You can actually reuse them in your Skype for business environment. The really cool thing is that um, Microsoft and Polycom have announced a uh, partnership to build a cloud Interop service. So if you think about this world where you're going to Office 365 and you live in Office 365, your emails are in Office 365, your SharePoint is in Office 365, your Skype for business is in 365. You need a cloud interop service to bring those non-Microsoft devices into into the into the meeting. So that um, we're, we're hearing that's going to be out by the end of the year, uh, and that will be uh, located in, in next to Office 365 in Azure. Um, and you will there will be a subscription charge. I don't know what the price looks like yet. It's, it's vague where at this point, uh, but it's good that someone's addressing that um, addressing that need because. Microsoft, once once you, you're using the Microsoft Cloud, you're going to want to have things like this. You don't. Why would you have something that's left on prem? You know, you want you want to be able to use something like that to um, to get people into your uh, Skype business meetings. Uh, so Skype meeting broadcasts is the first thing. <laughs> you're right. You are a little less sensitive about that. Yeah. Uh, so this is a Skype broadcast meeting right now. So um, so basically, uh, it's. Designed for broadcast production, so if you are used to the Skype business uh, meeting experience, it's, it's quite different from a normal Skype business meeting experience. Skype for a normal Skype meeting is quite uh, collaborative. Um, you can see your participants. Um, it's very um, interactive. Um, there's a lot of collaboration going on, video, that kind of stuff. Skype meeting broadcasting is designed for a sermon on the mount, one to many uh, type broadcast. So up to 10,000 people in the meeting. Anyone's tried to do a Skype business meeting, you're looking at 250 participants maximum in a, link, a Skype meeting right now. A thousand if you do a few other bits and tricks. But for big customers, stuff like guys like unis, um, councils that are talking to ratepayers, uh, anyone with a large uh, base that needs to get a message or a video message out that you're using something like WebEx or you're using Livestream or you're using Ustream or any of these guys, um, even YouTube or um, Bbrick. For those sort of guys, we can do this now in Skype for business. So uh, no extra clients, no extra. Is that out now? It's 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 it is out now. It's yep. out now. Yep. And 2016. It. Yeah. It's in all spheres of life. Yep. It's in E1, E3, and E5. Yeah. Oh. So basically, any customer can get it. So you don't pay for the attendees. You only uh, need to have a paid user to yeah, yeah, run yeah. the meeting. Yeah. And it's been offered to hybridise and wireless. Yep. 
Yeah, to support the video, like if you were to present a video to the top. To well, you have to embed it in the PowerPoint right now. So if you embed it in the PowerPoint, upload the PowerPoint. Uh, so at the moment, uh, there's only two ways I can present with PowerPoint, or um, I can do a video on screen. So, so if you think about it from a normal Skype perspective, you can present your desktop, you can present an application, you can do whiteboarding, that sort of stuff. This is designed for either a PowerPoint deck or just video streaming out to a large number of people. Um, so at the moment, we've got a video stream here. You can see up here. Uh, that's yeah. the active video comes from here. Um, I also can bring other people in there to present video, and I can swap the video between them. So, uh, but then that's just laid over the top of the PowerPoint that you're doing. Yeah. So if you, uh, I'm mean, sorry, I'm talking more like presenting a YouTube. Oh, I like that. Oh, okay. That's yeah, what yeah. It, so I'm just checking if the stream's working, but that's what it actually looks like okay. on a, someone using oh, yeah. it. Cool. Yeah. So does that include Sway as well as PowerPoint as an option? Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't think so. Not at this point. I think you only get the option to present a PowerPoint. And when you say present, you said upload the PowerPoint into. Yeah, so if you embedded a video, server, yeah. if you embedded the video into the well, PowerPoint. Embedding, embedding it. So streaming it from YouTube in a frame inside PowerPoint, that works now. With or Skype? Does, yeah, if it doesn't work with Skype right now. Okay. That does it? Do, no, I don't it? know. I don't oh, know. No. yeah. Um, I haven't tried it, but uh, I've been told if you embed the video, so you, there is ways to download a video off YouTube. You yeah. know, I think if you embedded that into the PowerPoint, when you upload the PowerPoint, um, it may, it'll re-render the whole PowerPoint. That's what I've done right now. So it's re-rendered the whole PowerPoint. Um, that's what I, that's what I understand can work. Um, but it's very much a work. It, this product is getting improved on all the time. So at the moment, there's um, I can't present my desktop, which is strange. But that will that feature will come. Stuff like Q and A. So we can do a Q and A uh, session um, right now. Uh, it's Yammer integrated. You can integrate a Yammer feed. Um, into the site. So where Laz, when you saw the video on Laz's screen, you can bring up a pane for Yammer. Uh, also, I've got a Bing Pulse running today. So Bing Pulse is, you know, when they do the politics, when they do the interviews, you've got the worm. <coughs> so I've got a worm going right now. So people can say, no, nah, Stuart was terrible here at this point. No, no, he's fantastic. Hopefully it's fantastic. Um, so yeah, you can get some real-time feedback from uh, using the worm uh, oh, through Bing Pulse. We've got city council delivering council meetings using this right now in Australia. Um, we've also got quite a bit of interest from CFOs about doing financial results to their um, mm. apps. Yeah, right. that's that's yeah, that's what I, I think would be um, education would be very interesting. Yeah. yeah, and it's in the E one um, SKU, so like basically any edu customer um, can get can get this. So, um, so sorry, just back on the what Damien was talking yep. about with streaming yep. you know, video content. So streaming audio might also be an interesting challenge. Yes. From within the video. Yeah. Because you're talking about a new channel in yeah. audio having to be delivered. Yeah, so what you can do um, right now is um, I don't have one here today, but uh, because uh, Skype Media Broadcast needs a video stream, you can actually uh, plug, say, a HDMI source into a little, they call it a, a USB to HDMI adapter. It's called a Magewell device. It takes HDMI stream in one side. USB 3 out the other side and it presents it as a webcam. So that may be a way you could do it, is have the video, um, it's a bit agricultural right now, but you could have the HDMI output of a PC that was playing the video into the Mazewell device back into another PC to do the stream. It's a bit agricultural, yeah. I don't know. Um, but that, that's the way Microsoft are doing town halls and stuff like that right now, um, until they build this, the, either the into the software, do it in software. There's obviously a much easier way to do it in software, but it's just not here right now. So if you have to do that, there are there's a hardware solution which takes the video feed, brings it back into Skype, which looks like a webcam. So where Nathan's up here, so where I've got, um, I can right click on my video and say make active video. So the idea behind a Skype meeting broadcast is you have someone like Nathan who hasn't done anything right now. Um, <laughs> running the meeting. So Nathan, 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 it does give the label of producer. Producer. Yeah. So, so, Nate, so you have you have kind of rather than a Skype business meeting which has people that are presenters, um, it, it's more designed to a production team. So you have someone that runs the meeting. So for those councils that are running these meetings, they have someone that is switching between video feeds. Um, as you can imagine, council goes into closed session and things like, like that. So that someone has to pop up the feed and say, "Now we're in closed session. Now, now we're in open session." All that kind of stuff. So they have someone that runs the meeting, whereas from an IT perspective, in a, in a normal Skype meeting, you don't get involved. People just collaborate 
do whatever they want. Sky Mini is very is much something that needs to be uh, proctored or run by by someone. And typically, it doesn't have to be IT. No, it just needs to be someone who's yeah. been trained in those tools. Correct. Yeah. Um, so your Q and A manager will be coming at some point uh, this year. So you better add. Uh, so we can't do any kind of interaction with the stream right now, but in the future uh, we'll be able to do a Q and A. Uh, one of the cool things is that you can actually take the recording. So this is all recorded, and I was talking at the, at the, at the top of the thing, uh, at the top of the presentation. Uh, this stream is going up to Azure Media Services, and it's spread on a CDN network around the globe. So if we had someone dialing in from the UK, they would get the stream for this from their local Azure CDN. So they wouldn't have to come back to Australia to get to get that feed. So once you get this media into Azure, it can go anywhere. Um, so the other cool thing is you can then push the recording of this into Office 365 video. So has anyone seen Office 365 video? Yep. So it's like a video, it's like a YouTube, enterprise YouTube storage. Um, use it to SharePoint Online storage. You can then push these recordings straight into uh, Office 365 video and have it indexed and um, metadata and everything there for, um, for when you made the recording. So if you're doing a lot of this stuff, stuff it into Office 365 video and then people you know, review it in their own time. Where's the conference focus as hell? The conference focus. Focus, uh, the actual focus. Uh, I think this, this will be uh, in uh, leave line. Yeah. Right. So uh, we'll start with business online. Um, so we've got a hybrid environment. So um, I'm homed in a day in a data center in Australia, um, but I'm pushing this meeting out to um, uh, Azure. So if you join this meeting, if you fill the join link, um, you would just go straight to Azure. You don't hit any of our, our infrastructure. Um, the other thing I'll just quickly mention is that if you think you if you uh, are a uni and you've got five thousand students that are trying to connect to an Azure Media Stream, um, that's going to really <laughs> smash your smash your bandwidth. So there's guys, um, Hive and Collective, which make uh, multicast uh, aware uh, software that you can run locally inside a network, so that when you are going to Azure rather than hitting going out to Azure, you're actually just hitting the local the local cache. So those options are available. If you've got more bandwidth than you know what to do with, then it doesn't really matter. That's why everyone go to town. But um, yeah, it's uh, so they are thinking about the network um, capabilities of the product. Yeah, remote. What about remote access? Is that possible or to the stream? Yeah. Yeah. So this is um, at the moment I made this an anonymous meeting. Yeah. So you can just grab the stream. Doesn't matter where you are. As long as you got internet access. And just so get straight into the this screen. is actually just through a web page. No VPN, nothing. I just join, click to uh, join as a guest. No plugging. Yeah. So, so, we'll so we'll all the guys as well. So um, I haven't tested it, but it should should work. Yeah. So what Laz can do is he can rewind. So if he join the meeting get late, he can actually start it. Well, what am I doing here? You don't want to come. You're going to ask the same thing. The producer. You won't be invited next time, Brad. Sorry, mate. Um, yeah, so like Nathan said, you can watch the whole thing from the top. You can pause it, go away, make a cup of coffee, and pick up where you, you left off. So it's very similar to any of those other go to meeting or stream services that you're used to. Um, and I'll show you, I'll just do a quick demo. And this is going to be difficult for the guys on the stream, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, I will uh, make it quick. But I'll just show you how easy it is to um, put one together. So I'm just going to sign into uh, the Skype broadcast portal, and this is the same Office 365 ID that I use for, um, for everything else. So if you have a 365 tenant, you can log on to that URL as an app, and you'll be able to see whether or not it's got any broadcast set up for your tenant. Is that no more COVID? Okay. As a portal dot broadcast, yeah. it's got the common yeah. tenant. That's the correct tenant. Try to browse it. Is it going to be always the licenses, or is it just okay. kind of a preview? <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's, it's a call. It's a. It's, well, it's been released for the call. It's not a. It's not temporarily at anyone or something. No, it's been. Okay. It's been determined that it's. Uh, All right. Cool. I'm going to get multi-factor authenticated in a second. If anyone hasn't seen that coming out of Azure right there yet. That's what multi factor off looks like. <laughs> so I'm sorry, we have this um, um, people with franchisees or large performance sort of connected partners being able to do that for big town or meeting to a large number of internal mm -hmm. folk. Um, yeah. so typically, it's only 250 to 500 endpoints when you talk to Skype, and then giving you that 10,000 endpoint off. 
Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so it's it's loading a little bit slowly. Um, but yeah, I had to multi-factor off my phone, 3365 Azure AD to um, do that. So you can see now I've got my live meeting there that's happening right now. Um, it's an anonymous meeting and this is who organized it. Um, I've got some test meetings previously, um, but all I really need to do is go and set a new meeting. I'm going to call it um, council meeting, for example. I'll make it next week. Uh, what's Labor Day? I select the time, I select the duration. Um, I can put in my team member. So this is the people that are going to run the event. So um, I'll put in Nathan, check him. As for example, now I can make this an anonymous meeting where anyone can join, a secure meeting um, where I can just put in my email list or a DL, mm. uh, or I can say anyone from the entire company uh, can go. Uh, and also create a video recording for the download. So um, that means anyone that comes in later, misses a meeting, can, can grab the recording as well. So if I click create that, it will go off and create the meeting. So that's created now. I create an Outlook invitation, which is exactly what I did to um, the other day for, the, for everyone, anyone that was not, not attending. Make a wire, Mozilla. <coughs> uh, but anyway, it pops up a, a calendar invite and you can send it around. Um, what, I'm, what I also can do is do a customization. So this is where I can put in uh, a Microsoft Pulse or a Yammer. Um, so I can put a poll or a um, track my sentiment. Um, so there's only the two options right now, but there will be stuff like Q&A and there will be other options that you can put in there to customise this meeting. Um, you can also put a custom link for your help. So if anyone um, gets the invite and can't work it out, you can direct them to an intranet or anything like that. Um, but that's really that's really it. So I'm just going to click done. So you said you put like a dial-in as well? Okay. They can't dial-in right now. Okay. So there's no dial-in uh, ability right now. Uh, so it's purely online. Uh, but I guess you've got the option to, ter to turn this into either a normal Skype meeting, which you've got dial-in access. Um, obviously, when Microsoft bring PSDN conferencing and PSDN calling in, it, it's all, you will be able to do dial-in. And the moment it's broadcast, it's broadcast only. It's not only this thing. Yeah. So, you know, the phone is usually when you want to be able to talk back. So yeah. it does work at just a time. Sorry. Sorry to say it's not working. Or does it integrate with your exchange server? Uh, so if I do this, uh, so if, I, uh, if I've got the join link there, it's not working right now, but if I do create Outlook invitation, it um, generates an ICS file. Um, you then send it around to whoever you want it, and then it's a calendar in your um, exchange. Um, it's only not working, Shoot, you haven't got Outlook open. That's all. No, it's, I think it's Mozilla. In the Mozilla. <clears throat> I use Chrome, but um, I might start burning. <laughs> <laughs> There's a button in Outlook um, if you want to organise a meeting as well. Can you do it that way as well? Uh, you can't do it a broadcast meeting that way. You have to log into the portal. Um, but that normally for most customers is a single sign-on or a, a password synchronization. It's the same password to log on to those um, services. But if you have a look here, um, this is the uh, this is the my invite here. When Outlook decides to play ball. So that's the link that people get. So, um, so I actually put um, an extra thing in here which says test your access, um, which is a pre-recorded meeting. That you don't get that by default. Um, I put that in there so people can test it there. We have a couple of customers that want to test their firewalls and stuff before the before the meeting. Um, but yeah, normally you just click that and we'll take straight in. So that's pretty similar to the <coughs> Skype meeting invite, which, which should be good for users, so they won't be too confused. Yeah. yeah. If you've got um, that secured, like a secured meeting where you're inviting people, would yeah. you see, did you set up the portal as on the calendar? In your cat, if you were so invited, invited. probably the portal now and you invited me, could I set that there rather than bring uh, it to Let's try it. Uh, I just made it for next week. Uh, what is your email? Uh, Jason, J A S O N dot org, that's B A U G H. You are at the at apn.com.au. I'm on an evening.
Uh, actually, you can't do it external at the moment, can you? I don't think you can do an invite. Oh, okay. um, yeah, I think it's curious the other company. Yeah, um, so anonymous yeah, would be. I know that they are working on that because um, I've been reading a lot of Yammer threads around. Yeah. They are bringing in a external um, cook, but I imagine it would show up in your yeah, your actual portal. Yeah. Um, cool. So that's really a quick way to get uh, some business meeting broadcast set up. Uh, the other thing is uh, you do need uh, if you want to do a hybrid, you want to do a hybrid between. Uh, Skype for Business Online and Skype for Business on Prem to do this, you do need um, uh, Skype for Business 2015. So I don't think Link 2013, uh, even with a Skype for Business 2015 edge, will work. Uh, <coughs> next thing we're going to add, I'll quickly in, is uh, Cloud PBX. You, wouldn't, you don't know how long it took me to find Lego minifigures on <laughs> transparent backgrounds on Google Images. So big images. <laughs> took me a long time. Uh, so yeah, what I spoke about before, it's, it's core control out of Office 365. So the services that you use to running on-prem, it's, it's pick, practically picking up your Skype for Business server dumping in Office 365. You get the same uh, services out of Office 365 as you do uh, from your on-prem environment. Uh, at the, at, I just have a note down here, uh, VBX phones are supported right now. So if you've invested in Polycom VBX phones or Link Phone Edition devices, they will work with Cloud PBX. So you need to be on version 5.4.0.a, I think, is the release for VBX. Um, and I would put your LPE devices would need to be up to date uh, in live updates. Um, but those will work. You can actually register them to Office 365 today. Um, any, anyone seen the new Polycom Trio conference phones, um, the, the new conference sound station replacement? Those work with Office 365 right now. So you can use them as a, uh, as a conference phone with Office 365. Uh, I might skip the demo because I'm running a bit behind uh, on Cloud PBX, but all, all I was going to show is moving a user from our on-premise environment into Office 365 and then licensing them for Cloud PBX and that way the user can sign in, use all the same telephony services, but they're hosted out of Office 365. So they still come back through my um, gateway and go out uh, to get the same telephone number. Um, but yeah, I'm using all core control features out of Office 365. So is the core control features the same? as? The on prem yet, or is that still parity? Uh, there's there yet? a couple of things you can't do. Um, okay. you, there's no response groups in Cloud PBX. Sorry? Do you go back to one? Oh, yeah. oh, sorry. Transfer calls on the line. Yeah, so um, the big things I noticed you can't do right now is response groups. Okay. Um, so um, you can only do team call. Um, uh, sim ring will work, um, but you just, yeah, response groups is the big one right just now. Just response groups? Uh, auto attendance um, are a work in progress. Yep. Uh, auto attendance you can do in Cloud PBX, but they're more like a virtual receptionist. So yep. it's designed, if you think of Cloud PBX, it's great for uh, Greenfield if you're an accountant or a um, thing and you want a phone system. Yep. Perfect. Yep. You, know, you, don't have, you don't have a lot of comp complicated um, you know, right. flows and things yep. like that. Yep. You might have a couple of um, pods of users and things like that. Cloud PBX is perfect. Cool. Especially when you'll be able to get the PSDN services from Microsoft. You effectively have an internet connection at your offices and that's what you need. Yep. Um, so, Stuart, you're seeing environments from customers where they're keeping the call center on premise, yep. they're taking the rest of them up to Cloud PBX yep. because of that to Yeah. Yep. So basically it comes down to a decision point. Do you need response groups uh, for whatever reason? Leave those users on prem, move the rest of the users to yep. Office 365 and get the same. Yep. So you're saying you've got full UCMA integration of the cloud? Not right now. So if you want to use CMA, you, uh, they are building a trusted app it's, uh, API. Yeah, we know about that. Yeah. So you use this power? So it's E5 or there's an independent add-on called Cloud PBX. Yeah. They're just on top of A1 or A3. Yeah. Any idea when all the response groups in the Probably the second half of this year from what I understand. Oh, right. um, so um, it's, it's well known. Um, but it's a it, it's a block off for some customers because they uh, you know like councils are one thing you ring someone for a plumber plumbing you want to get a plumbing compliance certificate it routes to someone else all that kind of stuff so if you've got advanced routing things like that um, call routing you may leave their users on premise um, if you've got fairly simple call um, uh, yeah a lot of people using team call and things like that sim ring cloud PBX 
that uses a, they're a candidate for Cloud PBX. Um, so PSN conferencing, this is um, for the current geos. Um, so uh, as of March the 1st, uh, as you can see Australia on there. But in the future, you'll be able to get dialing numbers in well, we have 90 countries by the US summer, which is our winter. So we're at 90 countries right now, we get dialing dial -in access. Um, you'll also, it will also support dial out. So if you are joining uh, a meeting, you get the, the system to call call those people up. So um, yeah, it'll it'll um, as I said before, it's cool across the tenant. So um, the one thing you can't do right now, but with coming, is private meetings. So does anyone use um, who has been guilty in starting a business where you have you just have the same meeting ID and then you get people joining? <laughs> yes, yeah, I do it all. The time. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> so at the moment, uh, when you are home in Cloud PBX, you have one conference ID, and that's universal. You can't you can't dynamically change your uh, conference numbers or your 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 need identifier for the conference, but that that is coming. So um, that that will be on the coming shortly. Uh, so PSD and calling. So at the moment, uh, United Kingdom, UK is coming up soon. Uh, so US right now, UK in May. Uh, Germany, France, and Netherlands uh, this financial year. Australia TBA. So we're hoping there's going to be some word about the first of May, but it sounds like it's going to be pushed back. Um, so you can get toll-free numbers uh, for PSD calling. Um, international calling will be per minute. Um, whatever else. Uh, yeah, so the porting process, I don't quite know how that's going to work for Australia, but you will be able to port numbers. Um, as before, I don't think you can bring just one number. You'll have to bring a block or buy a block from, from Microsoft. I suspect most people will probably just buy a block of numbers from Microsoft for a POC or a, um, for, uh, a pilot. Uh, so but then when you get confidence in the system, you, you can port your number ranges over to uh, Microsoft. That's true. Would you know if uh, mobile calls are included or not? I don't know. I uh, suspect. Unlikely. Don't know. I can't comment on that. Um, the, even the metering rates, I think, like the US and UK, are only just being decided right now. So, um, but it's like it's like in the tenth sort of set cents per minute, I guess. Probably a matter of magnitude cheaper than what you're paying right now in Telstra. Yeah, the Australia's very skewed in where they charge so much for mobile. Yeah, yeah, fixed to mobiles are expensive. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Well, um, you guys are corporate managed customers, so you just need to keep in touch with um, who's, who, who manages you guys, Microsoft. Okay. Do you look up to Anne? Do you look up to Tourism no, Events? No, 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 I forgot the chance, I think. Chance, yeah. okay. Yeah. Bob, Bob, okay. Bob, okay. Yeah. 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 Um just oh, keep in touch with her and she she can tell you the, the billing rates for um, when they get solidified. So but suffice to say if they don't bring something competitive to market, that's fine. Um so if anyone's running Event Zero, um Event Zero, does anyone know about Event Zero? It's a company that was started in eight mile planes, so they still have staff in eight mile planes. Uh, Microsoft bought a whole bunch of their tech. Uh, a couple of months ago, and now they've, um, in, they're integrating it through the Skype business online. So this, you'll get the same, you'll get access to these analytics and oh, through cool. the uh, Office 365 service. So Event Zero, Zero still operates as its own entity. They're still selling their own product for on-prem or whatever else, and the cloud hosted product. But Microsoft have bought the analytics engine and everything behind what they were doing and uh, implementing it into Office 365. So you'll get this looks like it's Microsoft's own environment, so you've got you know, 253,000 calls, uh, voice calls, video calls, you know, all that sort of stuff, get trending, get adoption numbers, all that kind of stuff, quality reporting, all that kind of stuff. So you'll get um, probably you'll probably get better numbers and better analytics out of this than you would ever get out of your um, your on-prem environment because they've just got access to such a huge amount of um, telemetry. And so you're talking like about doing what we might call call accounting in here? Is that no. capable or is it just general traffic? No, right now. No? Okay. Um, I know it's on the roadmap, but yeah. I don't think it's. I don't think it's this year. Um, call it call accounting and billing. Yeah, just you know, yeah. internal billing. And, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, it'll be it'll be it'll be identified. I don't know what the engineering at the okay. time is. So. It may also be a case where just because you're a user, you're a user of the service, so you're just a flat fee. So the organisation not necessarily cares about recovering the brand name. No, no, no. Calls that's that's right. Yeah. It. Yeah. Just depends. Okay. I imagine you will get granular billing of um, stuff like international and and calling, uh, conferencing stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. You'll be able to get that, but I don't know about no you know, internal chargeback and yep. things like that. Okay. And that's available at all levels, E3. Yep. No, yeah. 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 There's no there's no distinction. Uh, there's right. no um, 
can't be yet to hide need to sit on SharePoint on one plan too. Yep. So the PSM comes in for when need to sit on have a SharePoint on one plan too with foundation. Yeah. Or what E3 E3 includes SharePoint on one plan too. Yeah. So it's, right. it's so SharePoint on one plan oh, Skype business on one plan too with an E1. Skype business on one plan too with an E3 and with an E5. Yeah. Um, Cloud PBS needs to be added to any of those as a separate option or E5 includes Cloud PBS as part of it. So we can walk through the different ways that they've combined it. PSTM calling can then go on the top of Cloud PBX. Yeah, so you basically have to buy the Cloud PBX that gives you the ability to register your phones and everything else to Office 365. Then you add PSTM calling to the service. So if you want to give people the ability to do PSTM calling, you have to add that. And then license them for PSTM conferencing if you want them to do PSTM conferencing. So um, you'll have to just do run the numbers when it all comes out um, and do the TCO versus what you're doing on prem. Um, but I imagine it'll probably come out quite comparatively. Like, you know, not a, lot people, not a lot of people want to go down the path of running their own exchange servers right now. Yeah, it just doesn't make sense. Um, so, Cloud Community Edition came out two weeks two weeks ago. Um, so, it is a. Um, it's great. Uh, it is a. So, this is the current way that we do things, right? So, if you know, most, most deployments have. Uh, the demilitarized zone here, leak edge, reverse proxy, you get your link servers, and you start business servers here, some SQL, a gateway, exchange UM, OW, uh, Office Web Apps, all that kind of stuff. So you can see it's a still a fair bit of infrastructure required on prem, and then just extrapolate that out for anyone that's running a, a large enterprise, you, you basically need to triple what you've got there to, um, to get redundancy. This is the way the Cloud Connect tradition will work. So you will have it's pre, it's four VMs that are pre built that you download. Um, you've got a domain control block, which does not attach to your existing AD. It's a completely separate domain controller. It's designed like an appliance. So if you've got to start thinking of this stuff as, a, as an appliance, you just run, you just run it, set, set and forget type stuff. Um, it's not something you have to go and maintain as another piece of infrastructure. Um, but it's got a mediation server component, an edge server component, a central management store, and a domain controller. So it's all self-contained, Piper V only at this point. Um, and it needs its own dedicated host. So um, 50 calls, 50 concurrent calls, 32 gig of RAM, dual cores, uh, four quad cores, I think, uh, 32 gig of RAM, uh, a couple of mix because you need to straddle, straddle from different networks. Um, but yeah, it goes up, there's another version which is, does 500 concurrent calls. And you can actually stack these. So if you make sense, you can stack Cloud Connector editions uh, in a site to get um, up to uh, up to the numbers that you need uh, for concurrent calls. That being said, is if you're thinking about stacking these, probably just deploy Skype for business server and be done with it because it doesn't really make you, <laughs> doesn't reduce your footprint. Uh, but you can imagine for some sites that don't have a lot of complex collecting needs, this is set and forget. You deploy the VMs, sync it up to Office 365, turn on the services, and, and, and off you go. That's the, that's the way it's designed to work. So your users will be in your land. This, these VMs sit in, uh, in the DMZ, in the DMZ, so you do have to do some work around firewalling and stuff like that. Um, your ISDN services will come into a qualified IP PDX or a qualified gateway, um, but all the rest of the services sit in Office 365. So this is the model you need until Microsoft can deliver the PSTN. This is only needed to give you PSTN into Office 365. So if you have to do something right now, this is the model you look at. It's all the VMs connected up to your ISDN circuit or your SIP trunk circuit, bring those services into Office 365. If you can afford to wait, that will be negated by the PSTN calling and PSTN conferencing services that are coming out later, later in the year. So you won't need this uh, as safe. But if you have to do something right now, that's what you need to do. Sure, would it be correct to say also that if you had a scenario where you needed to keep a full center on Reddit, Yep. But you're moving the rest up, which you would use this scenario even when we get to the intent of the call. Yes, uh, it just depends uh, around um, the integration of the, the contact center because, um, like Jason pointed out, um, Microsoft doesn't do any UCMA or there's no API that's exposed for contact centers at the moment. Um, but in likely that will that, that's going to change. You'll be able to have a contact center that talks directly to, to Office 365. The other option you've got is if you don't want to do Cloud Connector, you can actually use a Skype for Business normal server you've got today. You can set it up to do this and do, do the bring your own telephony to 
the Office 365. Um, so you still get stuff like media bypass, you still get all that kind of stuff. So you uses, if you think about it, you use the media, your, tel your telephone calls aren't ping ponging back to mm. Office 365. Um, it's just signaling goes back to Office 365. Your media will still will still go out via your local gateway and you'll talk directly to the local gateway. So it has to sit in the DMZ because we use the Edge server to talk to, to Office 365. Uh, service Hub, uh, <laughs> <laughs> close uh, it is, uh, I think it's like uh, a noisy about Hub, but um, suffice to say these are supported in Office 365 and they have very much a compelling reason to deploy Office 365. Uh, the Hub is really, uh, really, it's really a driving force in that. Uh, so Project Rigel, so this is what it looks like right now. So it's designed to capture, I think they said it's about 90 Seven percent of the meeting rooms that don't have uh, have only have a, a projector or a TV, nothing else. Uh, Microsoft wants to build a solution that you can put into those meeting rooms that will give you a service hub like experience. So you can see this is a uh, Logitech device. So it's actually a Pro 4 in a Logitech dock. You put in the middle of a room, uh, attach cameras and bits and pieces to it, and it becomes your service hub like experience at at, at a much cheaper. So I'm actually pretty excited about this because no one's been able to do this in the third party for a long time. Like you think of people putting skins over link and turning kiosks and things like this. This is the solution for those kiosks or those um, meeting, meeting rooms that need um, some kind of um, VC. But they don't need telepresence and they don't need to spend mm. twenty or thirty thousand dollars on. Or if you have spent it, you can use it anyway. Yeah, correct. Uh, it'll also do all the one node integration. It'll, it'll act like a hub, but in a commodity PC. Service prototype format. So I'm actually pretty excited uh, about those. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to walking in and not taking 10 minutes to get the meeting room to yeah, Absolutely, yeah. So, um, so as you can see, um, I don't know if I'm here, but you can't really see it, but you've got three buttons on here, and one is whiteboard, one is uh, call, um, and the other is just present. present. Um, so if you just want to present, you said it's a display. So you only get three, three choices. Your, uh, the blue bar is where your meetings show up, so the user just walks in to that resource, clicks join, gets joined in the meeting, that's it, nothing else needed to be done. Uh, cloud intro. So I spoke a little bit about this at the top. Um, this is to basically bring your Polycom and your life size and your Cisco systems into Skype for Business Online. So that'll be um, a subscription based thing, so you may not license everyone for that. Um, but yeah, it's good to see that there is an offering coming out there because um, no bones about it, Skype is a proprietary system and you're trying to get things that do not appear to that proprietary system into that meeting. So it's all well and good if you can run a complete Microsoft ecosystem and everything's end to end Microsoft, but if you want to bring a, a legacy device or a Cisco Tamburg stuff that doesn't talk, Skype for business doesn't talk any of this sort of thing, you need the interop piece to go in there and, and transcode different uh, signaling, different codecs, things like that. Polyphone will bring that to market later this year, um, and that will be hosted in Azure in Australia. In Polyphone firmware, is it 5.4 or more? No, no, so to, to use this, this isn't out yet, but to use the Cloud PBX stuff you're talking about, you need to, the PBX just needs to be on 5.4.0.8, I think. It's the, the it's like for a Polyphone Group 300, for example. Yep. Is there a better firmware in there? So group, group is different. So group right now, you can't register. To Office 365, but in the June timeframe you will. So if you've invested in Polycom Group Series, you'll be able to register those directly to Office 365. So uh, you just have to wait for 5.2 or 5.23 is the code version that you need to wait for. Uh, it's in beta right now, uh, but once that's done, you'll be able to register your VBXs, your Group Series, everything like that to Office 365, and not have not have any on-prem stuff if you don't want to. What's additional license? Was that excluded? This will be an additional license because it's going to be it's going to be Polycom will run the service. So it'll be built through 365, I imagine, but Polycom are going to build it sitting. The idea is because you have to sit next to Office 365 and you have to build it in the same the same infrastructure and the same forest because that's the way you talk. But it won't be a license to register a group of 300. No, no 365. If you've, you've already bought, the, if you've already bought Skype for Business interrupt licenses for group series, uh, Polycom group series. That'll work for registered to Office 365. Um, 
I'm getting to the end of my prezzo, um, but I just thought I'd quickly mention, uh, is anyone here know Paul Woods from Data3, who was Data3? Uh, so Paul ran a, 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 a um, business unit inside Data3 called Business Productivity Services, so I'm going to talk about Data3. But, um, <laughs> uh, so Paul decided that there was a really um, a niche part of the market where everyone loves this technology, but no one knows how to, no one knows how to deploy it and how to adopt it properly. And how to get the most out of it. So everyone, I can talk to you about tech, and we're all a bit techy here, and we can, we all love tech, but the end users don't love tech. They just want to use it and get the most out of it and do their jobs. So Paul uh, started a company called Adopt and Embrace, um, and it's purely focused on Office 365 adoption, change management, stuff like writing business cases to get funding for Office 365, things like that, to, to talk about productivity, to talk about how we can make um, use of tech to get more out of, more out of those users. So. He's doing great work in councils. We're using him on a bunch of councils that are deploying Spark business. He's running executive hand-holding sessions to try and get them on board with things like Office 365, Spark for Business. Um, he's a Brisbane-based dude, so like um, like us, you should use him because he's really good. Um, but yeah, Adopt and, Adopt and Embrace is his, uh, his website. So he's focused on adoption and consumption. So you can actually come back to you and go, here's 300 people using Yammer, and this is the engagement level that we've got. Um, he's really focused on those metrics and trying and metrics that actually matter, not just I enable the license and off you go. So um, if you want to have a chat with Paul, um, he couldn't be here today because he's out billing because he's a starter. <laughs> uh, but he's a really, really good guy, really loves tech, and he's, um, yeah, Microsoft will put a lot of time for him. So I, I think I know where he is today. He's okay. at a customer where he's doing Skype for Business adoption. Yeah. Uh, so they had a challenge where they rolled out Skype for Business about 18 months ago, but they, the, those, you know, those, those final mobile workers in the field just hadn't picked it up. So he's worked with them around a program of identifying scenarios for their estimated in the field as a civil engineering company. Very specific scenarios, but he's then working with them on the training and adoption, and then coming out the back of that with success metrics. And then that company is looking at that particular project and saying, if we can if we can make these changes and this approach works, then we'll potentially look at a series of works about other scenarios where we can drive change and value to those end business users that um, that Paul will coach them through. So he's doing some really interesting work um, around the whole suite, but Skype business very often being one of those early players that can really help people show the the um, the value of the investment that's been made. Yeah. And um, I don't know if there's an Office 365 user group that runs every month. Paul did a session. Uh, last week on um, a methodology he's put together called Lean, Lean User Adoption, so it's very buzzwordy. Um, but he's actually got a really, really good methodology around how you can actually get technology into, um, to get people to adopt the technology. Uh, because the biggest hurdle, as some of you will know, with Skype for Business is it's not often you guys that are, have the trouble with Skype for Business or any other productivity issues. It's, it's reception stuff, it's EAs, it's PAs, it's that sort of stuff. They're just trying to get their heads around the tech. If we get people in early with you know with using methodologies like Paul, it makes our lives a lot easier. So, um, and at the end of the day, I don't like I don't know how to write a business case. Paul's a guy to, to help do that. So, I thought I'd give him a quick plug. Um, I'm not on commission with Paul either, though. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, if you want to talk to him, uh, someone at Microsoft, or we can uh, we can uh, refer you to Paul. But he's uh, he's a really good guy. Uh, so we're at the end. Uh, I'm just a couple minutes late. Uh, that's our website. Um, it's got lots of cool animations and things like that. Uh, we blog quite a bit around uh, different tech things and uh, some of the things we're seeing out there. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter and I retweet and tweet kind of random stuff. Uh, a few bits about Lego. Um, and our, uh, our Twitter feed as well. Um, we're here till, uh, I think we've got the room booked till three, so if you want to have a chat to any of us around, so we've got Laz here, stand up Laz. Um, the producer. That's the producer himself. <laughs> <that myself. laughs> uh, so if you've got any questions around, Current Skype for Business uh, deployment, or what you're looking at in the future. Uh, I'm happy to answer any uh, any questions or shout them out now. Uh, we'll keep the stream going for how uh, long, but uh, we'll send the Prezo around. So if you want uh, the Prezo, I'm happy to send that around. Uh, so you can kind of refer to back, and they also I'll send you a link to the stream in case you want to forward it to any of our, any of your uh, partners as well or colleagues. Cool. Well, that's it from me. Uh, if anyone's got any questions. The Q and A completely annihilated. Is there a timeline on the Q and A? Uh, don't know. No, no. Uh, not officially, so it's, okay. it's understood to be an important component. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a lot of, lot of, there's a lot of feedback around Q and A. So you
uh, quite the same as you've also got so if you actually watch watch the feed on Lazarus computer there's about a 30 second delay yeah so from Stuart talking and presenting yeah to actually they're going up with you or mixing up and um, um, spitting it out spitting it out so I think there's some work on how those the questions are asked but then answered so that's where that the producer role comes in yeah if those those questions are to be curated. As well, the question being asked, you're already on to the next topic. Yeah. So that's you sort of need that curator for the um, for the broadcast, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. It's the little hand up model with some of them. Yeah. yeah. It's got a question. Yeah. Um, I suspect it will be over um, yeah, a bit like Q and A was in um, live meeting and stuff like that, where it was you put your hand up, you can ask a question, it gets curated. Because in a meeting with ten thousand people, for example, Microsoft did town halls. You do not want everyone just flatting out like that because it's not a recipe for um, for a good meeting. So then, um, or career limiting moves as well. But uh, yeah, so Q and A, I think it'll be curated. So I think then you then you approve the question. That's what I think. So I think it'll go back to more of a live meeting style. Whereas Link or Skype business right now is just here's the IM window, ask the question. Um, so this is a kind of a different approach. So. You can use both. You can use these interchangeably. You don't have to use broadcast for everything. But if you're doing a CEO, CEO wants to do a sermon from the mount type thing, broadcast is probably the way to do it. Would you suggest, um, from a development perspective, that broadcasts become more concurrent over time, or is it um, designed specifically for that? I think it's being designed with that delay in mind. Uh, I don't. I haven't seen any reasoning behind. It. Um, but it makes sense if I've got to get the stream up to Azure, render it, spit it back out. There is a recorder, there is going to be some delay. Because um, in a normal Skype business meeting, you would record, you can't get that recording until after you finish the meeting. So it's also, I guess, just streaming, but also recording it as well, so then you can rewind during the stream. So there's a few other things happening at the same time. So I'm just sort of thinking of the financial results. Um, environment, for, for instance, yeah. where that yeah. first part of the broadcast is perfect. Yeah. But when it comes to Q and A session after the, the results have been delivered, it needs to be more concurrent at that point in time. Yeah, good point. Yeah, uh, I'll take a final. See if I can pick up anything over there. Yeah, it's exciting times in, in this uh, in this space. So uh, we've seen some really cool stuff, especially with the PST encompassing and PST calling. I think it's going to shake take a lot of things up. Yeah, it will. Are there any file size limits on the PowerPoint or performance issues with huge PowerPoint files? Uh, I don't know. Mine was 6 meg and it went up okay. Um, I can imagine if you're doing what Damien wants to do and put a video in it and send it up. Uh, I, I guess it comes down to bandwidth, um, how fast you can get that uh, PowerPoint up into uh, Skype for Business Online. Uh, well, with stream, it's just a video stream going out. So. It is, yeah, yeah. So there is some guidance around uh, bandwidth, network limits for this product, you can kind of make an assumption based on that. I don't know if there's a specific limit for um, PowerPoint. I haven't. I think there's 250 meg limit in Skype business normally for PowerPoint. Um, if you've got 250 meg PowerPoint, you've got problems. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I'm not sure. The audience has problems. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, but I don't know. Embedding video, I, I don't know. That, but video seems to be a pain point at the moment for a lot of people around. Embedding a video and then streaming it out. So you can preload them down here. Yeah. Yep. So, so pre we preloaded we, we pre it 20 minutes beforehand before you start your broadcast, and then you just click over to present so you can upload multiple PowerPoints yep. into that. Um, what I also didn't uh, <coughs> say is that you can, it re records anyone that watches the stream. So because I'm at an anonymous meeting, I can't tell who's there, but I can dump out who joined uh, or you know, the person joined using this browser, stayed oh, for this long. All that kind of stuff. So you get some metrics around who's attending your meetings as well. When you're doing a secure meeting, or people that are identified, it'll show you who joined and who didn't. So if you want to do analytics around that, um, you can put that into a pivot table and show you kind of engagement and things like that. But um, yeah, I'm really pretty happy with um, the direction that Microsoft's going. So um, everyone kind of needs to get on board, otherwise you get, especially as partner, you get kind of over a bit. But yeah. Once the PSTM side moves out to cloud, um, what, what do you think will be the type of um, you know, networking infrastructure that you're going to need to support it? In our case, yep. a SIP trunk, we have one, it's coming up for a year. It would be nice to not lock in for another two years 
Uh, yeah, go contract your month to month, probably is sensible for you guys. Um, what, what do you think is going to be the type of networking you're going to need to? Uh, I think express route, route. Express route is is very going to be very important. Uh, so, Ford just made some very interesting announcements about their express route for officers at cloud pricing. They're doing some really interesting offers at night. Who did? What was that? Megaport. Oh, Megaport. Yeah, oh. they have a session here. Oh, they're doing, they are they talk about quantitizing. They can have some really, really low costs yep. for um, servicing that. So, um, that particular area is changing, and we've dropped the price of express route 365 down as well. So. Interesting shifts there. To, yeah. If you've done if you've done the assessment before to look at, and the other question would be what level of um, information is out in the US in mm -hmm. terms of some of that analysis of the US market, which went live in December. Yeah. Uh, so Express Route, uh, so Megaport, as Zan mentioned, is Megaport can give you. Uh, so basically, the idea behind uh, Megaport is that they'll deliver you a, uh, an a cross connect mm -hmm. into your EV data center or somewhere. Um, you can get. You can team up with a last mile carrier like Telstra or someone else to, to connect the two. Um, but Megaport basically will give you uh, a cross connect straight into um, Equinix, which is where Azure and everything else um, stress expires is. Um, so the idea behind uh, Megaport is I think it's you get a one gig or a 10 gig connection, that's it. There's no other options, but you can actually give take a portion of that in terms of uh, I want 50 meg for Azure, I want 50 meg for Amazon, I want 50 meg for Google, stuff like that. So you can ch chunk that. Uh, pipe up. Uh, so Megaport charge, they don't charge on metering, so you don't get, there's no data, no bandwidth charges. It's either a 1 gig or a 10 gig connection into a colo or a last mile of the service. Uh, and it's, I think it's 350 a month for a 1 gig, uh, 700 bucks a month for a 10 gig, uh, and then you have to pay for a cloud, what they call cloud cross connect on top of that. So if you're only doing uh, AWS, uh, sorry, Azure and Office 365, it's 200 bucks for a cross connect. Uh, sorry, the cloud cross connect. So it's 900. We're up to 900 bucks. No usage charges. So there is some stuff you have to talk about with Microsoft with the Express Route service. But that's it. You can have a fixed cost. You can run 10 gig all day every day to Azure. You've just got to deal with the, the Azure charges. So um, in the Megaport proposal the other day, uh, news.com.au use. Um, you're not you're not using APM. There you go. Competitors. So news that that you have uh, megaport tails into the data centers um, and they used uh, the megaport tail to do a migration to Office 365 so they turned it on and they're 30 day contracts so you can just turn it off. So we've got they've they've got customers that use it for 30 days, upload all their stuff into Office 365 and then turn it off. And that's that's just their business model. So um, the idea they've got this fiber sitting all around the place and they just want to use it. So it's the same guy with next PC and, and that, but it's a really, really compelling offer, no data charges, anything like that. And you just get a, a, an express peered connection to um, Office 365 and actually so so do fiber that they're using. So, uh, I don't know. Some some, some, some is and some is and some is yeah. Yeah. So, good company. You should get <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So the megaport based here in Brisbane, so um, Bevan Slattery, the guy who did XDC and Pipe and all those guys, TPG, Salt TPG, he's the guy behind it. Um, but yeah, they uh, they have diverse, diverse parts everywhere. So, um, but they really they really aim all about diverse parts. So they, you know, some some carry they buy carriage from Optus and ABT. They're not quite sure where the fibre is, so they've actually gone to the level of getting trying to get diverse fibre everywhere. Um, so they, you can take two megaports, you can get two circuits in two different data centers. Um, one goes down, you, you still get to 365 and, um, and Azure from there. But um, that's where I think everything's going is megaports. So cutting cutting down 15 hops to off 365 or 10 hops to you know, four type thing. So you get straight on the network. You can do QoS over it as well. So you can set your QoS um, markings, things like that. Um, so that's where you you'll deliver your uh, quality of service through an express route from. If you are too small and you don't want to go to that extent, then you can just use it over the internet like, like you do today. Um, or you know, you use it. Real time comms has kind of changed that because no one cares if an email's two seconds away, but you can't have a conversation that's it's two seconds away. It's a big connection, isn't it? That's, that's big enough to do a lot of comms. Plenty enough for a small company. It depends. Yeah. We spoke to a couple of telcos that use riverbeds. Oh, yeah. Express Rail. Yeah. I mean, is that, is that possible using your existing connection? Up to, up to 
Uh, I've always excluded real-time comps from riverbeds. Uh, just, yeah. That's what they recommend. Um, I don't quite know. You, you still need uh, someone to deliver you that cross connect um, into your network. So whether it's Megaport, XTC, uh, Telstra, do it now. Um, XTC have a product called Avon, Axon DC or something like that. Anyway, they've got, they've got their branding for it. So yeah. There's quite a few providers that'll, that'll give you that peer access to uh, Azure and Office 365. Um, I can't comment with on Riverbeds, but as soon as you, you've got to get that, that cross connect into your network, otherwise you're um, you know where. So once it's in your network, how do your Riverbeds treat it? Um, I, don't, I, don't, I can't comment. The other thing you can do is pay for, so there's two versions of Express Route, there's standard and premium. Yeah. Premium gives you uh, peering internationally as well. So you can actually um, <coughs> have uh, Express Route circuits in different countries and Microsoft will carry that uh, peer traffic. So say for example, um, you, know, you might have a tenant that's located in Ireland, you can actually have an Express Route service here, pay for the premium uh, Express Route and they'll peer that traffic all the way to Ireland, so you don't go over the internet, you don't go over this other carriage, it'll go straight on Microsoft's backbone to, to Ireland. So there's some use cases for um, for getting that global peering arrangement as well. So the Megaport, um, other guys locally, I don't know any guys from XTC, but um, yeah, Megaport, if you're interested, just, um, I don't have any Jason's cards, but I'm shooting the details over to you as a solutions architect guy here, come and have a chat to you about it as well. But yeah, that's a long answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's where it's going, is it? Internet connectivity with Express Route, um, you need those as, as building bones for any of this stuff. So if you want to get rid of anything on-prem, uh, just have internet connectivity with Express Route, that's the way to go. Thank you. Do you want to officially oh, close Microsoft, thank you, Stuart Mack and Labs for, for presenting today. Oh, that's right. We're pretty excited by Scott business and where it's headed and the opportunity it's going to have for really um, for time and starting to pay with some of the expenses that are going out through your telco budget at this point in time, trying to give you some alternative options uh, to uh, to uh, deploy, leverage the cloud services, get more mobile, but also potentially save significant amounts on uh, on the cost of new and like communications. As Microsoft, I can't tell you how you know, how thrilled we are with the excellent partners we have in this space and think being you know, a standout for us. Uh, so I'm um, glad that you were all able to attend and hear from them today. And thanks, guys, for all the work that you've been doing. Oh, cool. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, um, thanks for coming on the live stream. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, it worked. Um, but yeah, as soon as I hang this up, the recording will be available. So if, you, if you've got the link, go back you know, and the recording will be there straight away and watch it.